Hi everyone, this is the lecture for the um, beginning beginning color studies going into the master copy and reinterpretation of the master copy. So um, these are going to be just some practice studies that you do. Um, they won't necessarily be turned in. They're, they're going to be very similar to turning them in for the palette, um, the photo of the palette where it's just a credit or no credit that you did them. But basically, we're basing this off of the idea that we've got a traditional color wheel. The primary colors on the color wheel are yellow, red, and blue. The secondary colors are green, orange, and violet. Tertiary co colors always start with the name of the primary color, and they're the combination of the two colors, the, the secondary and primary, that are on either side. So yellow, orange, red, orange, red, violet, and so on. Um, as we go through, we are also going to be keeping in mind some of this palette, which is basically a pigment relationship palette, using a lot of those same precepts that you saw on the previous um, color wheel, except that it's applied to like the various pigments and how they relate to each other. So placing warmer or more orangey yellows closer to the yellow spectrum, uh, redder um, oranges closer to the um, red spectrum with cool reds and warm reds, cool blues and warm blues, and so on all the way around. As you go to the interior on this, it gets less saturation. So you can see a couple colors I've placed slightly interior, but then others come in um, further interior, and then we've got blacks, whites, and browns are typically towards the middle because they're the least saturated out of the various pigments that we use. This also shows you the relationship of various browns and so on to their color families. So raw umber is within the yellow-green family, burnt umber is within the orange family, burnt sienna is within the orange-red family, and so on. Um, this is another color wheel called the Quiller color wheel, and it's basically um, an artist color wheel also that shows a lot of pigment relationships. This one's fairly well known. It's very involved, and it talks a little bit about different media because sometimes in different media you might get a slight temperature shift or um, pigment shift in the way it interacts with the media that's or the the item that's creating that media, such as um, gum tragosanth or acrylic or linseed oil or whatever it is. We refer much more to this one. Okay, I, I very, very rarely um, access this one, but it's just kind of nice information for you guys to have. Okay, so we've been focusing much more on value in our first painting that we did and trying to understand how color translates into value and accurately representing it so that later on we can do transparent color on top of this and our values will be set correctly and that transparent color will interact with the value that you've done underneath to make a new object. What we're doing in this painting, though, is we're working, these next two paintings, is we're working much more immediately. We're going to be playing with several things. The idea of like thick impasto texture, um, really rich brush strokes, and rich paint colors. Um, obviously, a tabletop might not appear quite this yellow green and quite this green, you know, desaturated green, but um, understanding how these colors interact within an, an image and how they create interest is really. Um, a great way to kind of practice and, under, and apply these into even more completed paintings such as the one that we'll be doing with the glazing. Uh, basically as we look at something like this, this is a photo of a bunch of objects under a light, you can see as we look at things that your tendency is going to be to look at this and go it's light blue and it's dark blue, it's light green and it's dark green, it's light red and it's dark red, but actually it's white and it's gray, but actually when you interpret this in color, you can see that there's a lot of range to experiment. So yes, it's still light green and dark green, but there's a lot more yellow within this green compared to this green. You can see that in order to not have this go pink, there was some yellow added into this, so it's more of a corally red color. Um, you can see, especially when you get to neutrals, like our background and like this little um, spool here, that the neutrals you can really play a lot with the color and have it look very natural but if you de if you desaturate it down but also get a real richness of color and this is kind of what happened as we were coming into the impressionist period so as we came into the impressionist period it was kind of happening around the same time as the academic uh, 
um, period where artists that were doing really refined paintings um, were um, like Bouguereau were doing these really beautifully refined paintings. And then along comes this group of a couple other artists, a few other artists that decide that what's really interesting to them is reinterpreting light, not just painting objects to look realistic, but actually really playing with color and interpreting light and seeing how light changes its color. Um, so we came up with paintings that were much more based on the impression, and that's a name that came during the first one of the first showings of these works. Some art critic looked at the works and said, those aren't paintings, those are impressions of paintings. But the painters of that style really took that up as their new name, the Impressionists, because it was what they were doing. They were basically trying to get away from the academic really refined, um, stiff paintings the way they thought about it and get to something that felt a lot more fresh, a lot more process oriented and really um, explored color and made the most out of color. So a realistic, a very realistic rigid painter might paint something like this bowl with predominantly grays and whites and umbers, um, but, but adding this bit of color and reinterpreting shadows with colors, using cool colors in some shadows, warm colors as reflected shadows, and so on, is a really nice way of exploring color, but still creating a sense of light on the object. So these are all different studies that have been done by contemporary artists, but I'm putting them in here just to give you an idea, an example of what types of things you might do. Before you go into painting your master's studies, what I would like you to do is get out some of these bright colors and play around and set up two objects at home on a maybe a, a blank tabletop and it doesn't matter if it's got a color or not and then reinterpret those objects using different um, colors for each take on it so maybe do one where it's the blues and greens like this this one is more of the warm greens and the yellows okay here we've got oranges and yellows um, and reds here we've got more purples and blues so each one of these paintings is a reinterpretation of the same subject matter, but using different color palettes. As we look at what the masters did, they did this quite frequently in interpreting the same subject matter, but at different times of the day. And that might be what you do with this. You might set something up where it gets the light of day, um, kind of shining through a window nearby or something and look at what, is this, what does it look like in the morning? What colors do you see, especially in your neutral objects? like a white teapot, what colors do you see within that object in the morning? What do you see midday? What do you see in the evening? What do you see late at night? And paint it using that reference instead. Um, these are all different paintings by different artists that kind of work in these manners, and I'm just showing them as examples on the way to really block in a very simplified structure of plane, but play with color and allow color and the abstract nature of the plane to become more important to you as you go through. So you can see there's some really nice examples. Some of these are very like thick impasto painting um, and the paint is the textures are really meant to help bring like areas forward. If you leave something smoother it sits more in the background. When you bring in a lot of thick texture and contrast it brings it more up front. So that's another way of creating depth. Um, these are beautiful. These are by one of the artists that I follow on Instagram. Um, and just a really beautiful understanding of like light and shadow and notice how the light side of like this yellow apple is much more yellow and the shadow side has a lot of like greens in it and the reflected light here. Um, same thing, you'll almost see like some lavender tones within some of these shadow sides. So I want you to feel free to kind of work very broadly like this, very roughly and immediately and see what you can come up with as far as interesting color compositions that make the most. These types of paintings, you really shouldn't be working on them any more than like 15 minutes to an hour at the most. And they should be pretty small. You can do these on your canvas paper. You do not need to do them on a separate canvas and they should be fairly small, like maybe no more than like six inches by 10 inches at the very most. Um, normally when we would do these in class, I bring in a bunch of small canvases. I buy a bulk pack of them, like 8x10s or 5x7s. Um, and then I just hand each student like three or four of those and that's what they do these on. So my recommendation is that you just get your canvas paper and depending on what size your paper is, maybe draw a line in the halfway mark and you don't 
have to do them like horizontal or vertical or square. You can do them whatever orientation you like. Set up a few objects, um, maybe put like a colored cloth underneath them to help you with seeing how you might want to play around with them. Um, this is something you could definitely do with like fresh fruit or something because you're only going to be painting for a short bit, so that shouldn't bother anything. Um, or might find some brightly colored versus very neutral colored objects and play with the differences between those two. Uh, so these are just some nice examples to kind of give you inspiration and you're always welcome to pull up this power or this um, lecture and just look through some of these examples again. Um, this is a different artist and this artist is really using the impasto paint as well as the use of color but they're definitely using the impasto paint to build depth so you'll notice that the front edges and the top edges of the flower they build lots and lots of rich impasto paint on it and then they let other areas be a little bit more smooth and not quite so resolved so that they can build depth using that thickness of the paint so that's another way of handling it this is one that is using more of a palette knife and these strong mark making ideas and and that's what i would like you to experiment a little bit with is try using your palette knife for painting try using very thick paint and your brush try kind of playing with it like what they do is they basically paint and use the palette knife and other tools to kind of drag the paint and create this kind of abstraction of an object you can see what it is but it's also an abstraction of it at the same time these are student examples these next ones that people did in class so i set up some objects and they predominantly used um, palette knives i really encourage that within class because the thing is, is that when you're using paintbrushes, it's very easy to get kind of caught up in trying to render things. With a palette knife, you don't really have a lot of control over that, so it's a little easier to stay loose. You can see that what they did is they picked very interesting ways of cropping down their objects. Um, I, my recommendation is to tone the background a little bit first with some sort of a bright color and do it very thinly and then work on top of that, and that way you don't have white paper peeking through, you have whatever tone you put behind it peeking through. It'll help the painting feel a little bit more complete. And then you can see that a lot of this is done with palette knife, kind of finishing it. Um, on this one, I also encouraged really looking for like different viewpoints than you would normally do. Um, so we'll come to a couple that are more looking down. This was a nice one. It's a little bit more resolved. They spent a little bit more time on it, but definitely did what I asked as far as like abstracting some of their shapes um, using the color in a more interesting way within here and allowing themselves to kind of break free of some of that classical painting that we focus so much on. This was a nice one and this is the other thing is that I don't care what your background is like if you want to abstractly break up the background into tones because that's what makes sense you can do that. So some nice examples from the students of ways oops, of ways to kind of treat this, of how to interact with the paint structure and how to build up lots of thick paint. If you have the wax um, that you were supposed to buy as we come into this section, hopefully you've got that or another impasto medium. What you want to do is mix that a little bit at a time into the paint you're using. Don't mix it into a big pile of paint unless you're using that whole amount because it will dry out that pile of paint over time okay more quickly than the paint by itself will usually dry out but what I do is I take my palette knife and I mix a little bit in the middle with some of that medium and depending on the medium it's usually around like a third medium to a half medium with the other half or other two-thirds being the paint color that you're mixing you might think about your textures that you're creating and how they help create contours um, breaking them up very intermittently. So hopefully these these paintings will kind of give you some ideas. You can see that we looked a lot about like how to try and crop these in a little bit more interesting way and how to play around with the backgrounds as well. The backgrounds and your use of color in the backgrounds can really make the painting or break it. This is a nice one as far as like using a different viewpoint. So this setup was actually on a white table in the classroom. There was no red here. And this was, and then this would be all just like the cement and chairs behind it. And that's how they interpret it. And they did it looking down on this. Hopefully that helps. And if you have any questions, please email me.